All right. Uh, I'm going to um, to say uh, hello again. Tante, you know, kissy cow. Good day. Uh, my name's Sue Ann, and I'll be uh, co-hosting uh, this webinar today um, on behalf of the Indigenous School Food Circle that uh, um, I co-host with Carolyn Webb and Sydney Richards. But we will have uh, Audrey uh, start us off with a, a welcome. I will leave the floor to you, Audrey. Hi, hi. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, pray first in English and then I'll tra translate it to uh, Cree. So this morning, I'd like to, well, I'd like to uh, say thank you to our Creator for giving us another beautiful day. Amen. We thank you for all these people who are around us today. Got to meet everybody today, and I wish we were uh, together in the spirit. I thank uh, Jen, and I thank uh, Chris here for inviting me to be part of this. That's an honor for me, and I ask our Creator to be with us, each and one of us today. We ask you to, uh, to help us with our day, help one another, have have a lot of input that we take that's valuable to our hearts and our mind, body, and soul. We ask the creator to, to help us throughout this whole day, not only this whole day, throughout all this, what we do, what you people do for the people in Canada. And also we, we thank him for another beautiful day because if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be here today. Amen. We, I ask you to glorify, to glorify him our creator is the same person as the creator. He's uh, the Lord Jesus. He's the one too. He's the one that's boss of everything. So it's good to, to know. I'm happy that I know him. He's in my heart. He's has me all day, all the time. I, I feel good him being beside me. So I ask you to be beside us here today. And, and uh, we thank you. In Jesus name I pray. Okay, now I'll say in my creed. Aki Samanto, the Pewita Mnano, the Kakyota, Kapepiax, Kogo, Gutagani, Potsko, the Kapchik, Nigami no Guta, Wawicha Hinan, Queska Pamihua, Queska Pixqua, Queska, Queska Kiweke Tutamak, Saki to win, Jamak Siako Maninan, Magawicha Hinankia, Yapaki Wake Skateman, Paki Way, Paki Way Mateman, and me Saki to win, we know we to win. Uh, we're going to help nurses. They're doing their best. They're uh, doing Amen. I cry when I when I pray. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Are you gonna come and sit here? Okay. I'll sit behind you. I'll listen. It was a lovely welcome. Um, so thank you all for being here today and sharing this space with us um, in our webinar, Growing Food on the Land in Indigenous School Communities. I will um, just share a little land acknowledgement with you all as I am joining um, well, virtually today as a wholehearted guest on the ancestral homelands of the Tanaha people, who are the original occupants and stewards of Amakas Tanaha. Um, we're looking at a photo here of the stunning hoodoos overlooking the St. Mary's River from one of my favorite places to adventure. Um, I always, uh, I also acknowledge all of the stolen and unceded lands in so-called Canada with respect to all Indigenous peoples across the vast lands we ground ourselves on with reconciliation in mind. Um, I also acknowledge my Nisuasic uh, Cree ancestors who come from Treaty 5 territory in Northern Manitoba, uh, who had their own experiences alongside colonization and the residential school system. 
I honor them by sharing my knowledge and speaking the stories and truths passed down to me to harmonize our perseverance as a culture and offer reciprocity to my ancestors, all my relations. Thank you again for being here today. Uh, please feel free to uh, acknowledge where you're coming from today in the chat uh, alongside your hellos. And um, I will just move on um, to a uh, little bit of the agenda today uh, as we've already had our welcome. Um, I will uh, further introduce the circle co-hosts. Uh, we'll go through the presentations. There'll be a panel discussion, an opportunity for questions, um, and then a closing. Um, uh, the Indigenous School Food Circle is hosted by the Coalition for Healthy School Food. Um, we get together uh, and share resources and uh, like-minded folks in the circle. We meet quarterly and uh, we have a chance to network and talk about our best practices. Um, and we coordinate these amazing webinars so we can get everybody together and have great discussions to uh, conjure up more um, information and conversation and uh, how this all will affect Indigenous students and um, school communities across Canada, Turtle Island. So we've got our three co-hosts here, um, Sydney Richards, uh, she's with Canadian Feed the Children. Um, we've got Carolyn Webb with the Coalition for Healthy School Food and uh, Farm to Cafeteria Canada. Um, and myself, uh, I'm with the BC chapter of the Coalition for Healthy School Food. So I uh, welcome you all and uh, hello, Carolyn and Sydney. Couldn't do this without you, that's for sure. <laughs> Our panel today, uh, we've got Jennifer Cameron and Kristen Scott from Beardies and Okamasis uh, First Nation, Lisa Troy with the Kamloops Food Security Council and also uh, she was with Skeetchison um, Food Sovereignty and uh, Tim Tomsinski with the Hamlet of Tulita. Uh, I'm hoping he shows up. Uh, but um, yeah, this is our panel today. We're gonna have some great discussions on um, growing food and how it all uh, feeds into um, school food programming and um, how it got started and where it's going. So. Our first presenters today will be uh, Jennifer and Kristen. Um, so uh, I will leave it to them and they can take over the screen. All right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um in an askum to now, Kristen Chat Nitsi Gasin, Jennifer Cameron is ye kaso, um Nitakosin Maga Nimiwetin. Um so I am so grateful for everyone being here today. My name is Kristen Schott and this is Jennifer Cameron. Um I am sick, I'm getting over a cold, but I am feeling good. I'm feeling really happy to be here today. So, but if my voice sounds a little weird, it's because I'm getting over a cold. Um, so we run most of the food programming here on Beardies and Okamasis Cree Nation. Um, we're about an hour north of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Treaty 6 territory. Um, there are about 1300 community members in the community of Beardies and Okamasis and roughly the same amount um, elsewhere in Saskatchewan, in Canada, in the US, in the world. Um, we're a small but mighty team. It's mostly just us. <laughs> um, but I'm going to let Jen talk about some of the specific gardening initiatives that we do here on Beard Hello. Not going forward. Sorry. <laughs> So as a part of the Bar uh, BOCN gardening initiatives, um, the Backyard Garden Group, it has been around for a few years now. Actually, it's been in existence longer than I've lived or worked in my home community. Um, there's approximately 30 registered gardens 
when we may have a few latecomers joining in before the end of the month when they realize I never got my application in. Um, although the number of unregistered gardens is actually much greater and it changes every year. Um, huh. <laughs> Within the past four years since I've started, um, there's been about 160 backyard gardens that have been installed. This is not including the 30 raised garden boxes that we have installed last year for those with uh, limitations. Um, we, we provide everything a new gardener needs. It starts from sod cutting to rototilling and hosting uh, classes on seed starting uh, and giving out enough seeds to fill their garden and hosting um, seasonal workshops in various methods of gardening. We prepare members with knowledge uh, so that generations from now will have that because it's been passed on through, through family connections. And then with our community garden, it continues to evolve. So have our gardening needs. We plant a variety of crops such as potatoes, onions, beets, peas and cucumbers, and many other varieties if the community requests. Um, we give community members with or without gardens a variety of days to come help plant, water, weed, and at the end of the season harvest so that we can ensure that we have produce for programming and community functions. We have previously invited the University of Saskatchewan to host a variety of classes where gardeners are able to apply this to our community garden or their own community gardens or personal gardens, family gardens. Um, our food forest is actually quite diverse. It is located beside the community garden, a two minute walk from our elementary. There's many pre-existing plants and trees such as Saskatoon's choke cherry, wild rose, rose hips, lemon balm, sage, sweetgrass, willow, and a really nice cluster of uh, Saskatchewan lilies, which is was really surprising to us because we didn't know that the first year we started, we went to the site and wrote down all the plants that we could identify. And then last year we discovered we had lilies. Uh, throughout the past year, we have planted a variety of fruit trees such as apples, pears, plums, and many others. We have many shrub-like plants, uh, blueberries, hascap, raspberry, um, blackberries, and currants. We, there is many different types of ground cover, but primarily what we have planted is strawberries and clover. Um, we had the students come in and plant marigold. And then at the end of the season, uh, we had those same students come in and find where they found, where they planted the marigolds and pick the deadheads and spread the seeds throughout the site. So ensuring that the seeds are spread and as well as they planted a variety of wildflowers. So it's it should be pretty nice coming up this season. I'm super excited. In regards to education on sustainability um, and food sovereignty, this is our primary goal and to ensure the future generations know what climate change issues they are growing into and have the skills to fight those issues. The community garden, as you can see, there's a before and after picture. Uh, the garden did suffer a little bit <laughs> with overgrowth, but that was due to the fact that we had students planting trees. We planted over 500 trees uh, throughout this past summer and I believe Sydney was a part of that and there's many other people that have contributed to mm -hmm. this to make it a success and it's still working. The community garden, we, we have pre previously planted onions and potatoes this last season where we're going to be adding more to it this year, hopefully initiating a no-till garden, raised garden boxes, trellises and inviting the horticulture class from the high school to be able to come and use what they've learned and adapt it into our food forest so that they can see the progress of their work 
growth to continue in years. <laughs> in the fall, we always um, invite all the students to come pick potatoes with us too. It's like uh, they they get excited and we get really excited too because it's like a treasure hunt for them. We like kind of dig them up a little bit and then they can look through the dirt for the potatoes. So that's probably my favorite part of the year is potato harvest in the fall. Within our food forests, it's actually quite extensive as I've stated earlier that we have planted over 500 trees throughout the site and we have many more trees coming in this season where we're going to have individual class come in and plant specific areas so that they know with each year that they can start um, watch the progress of what they planted. So within the picture, you can see six Yes, there is six people <laughs> within our garden, our food forest committee. And this is one of the locations where we have visited uh, a pre another food forest and just got to learn and be able to teach more people about what we are doing. So this next picture is the overall site of what we have started. The yellow is our fence line, which is approximately 3,400 feet. Um, within the site, within the blue dots and the green dots, the red dots is mainly of what we planted and the stuff that we've added in. So here's our, there's our school on the corner. So when I say a two minute walk, they literally walk behind the school and their garden is right there. And we have quite a bit of students wanting to come back frequently. They get upset when they have to leave, which is good for me, but not so great for the teacher when you have an upset student that wanted to come plant more seeds or dig up more potatoes or do something throughout the site. So within this next slide, you can see with the black lines is the trails that we have created. And they, they are approximately about four feet wide so that we can accommodate multiple groups of people if we have to transport elders to the other side of the site that we have equipment to be able to bring them over there without worrying that they could get hurt. So the, the purple square is where our, our pavilion will be and this, alongside it is our, our outdoor kitchen where we're able to host a variety of classes be able to just have people come and learn and just enjoy the site because it's a place where people didn't realize that they wanna be. And now that we have this within the community, a, a lot more people are wanting to be involved. They constantly ask me questions. When can I come? When can I do this? When can, when are you doing this? When are you doing that? Like, and, Throughout these past three years, it's it's really becoming something because COVID opened the eyes of many people and what our food what our food really is, and that has changed a lot from the past twenty years to what it is now. So within this picture here, um, the blue circle, I guess, is pre-existing Saskatoons. There's actually more places than what is put on the map of how much Saskatoons there really are. So we have the outhouse. <laughs> There's a little bathroom spot there. And then within the green corner up there is where we planted a bunch of jack pine where there was pre-existing trees there already. So we just added to it, making a mini forest. And we had students come in from the elementary and planted that area. And as I checked last week, all the trees are still surviving. Um, other trees have gotten bigger. Um, many trees are starting to show buds now. So it's going to be exciting to see what this year has to offer and the future years ahead of us. So um, this area purple area there is uh, we, this is basically the entrance to the food forest. We built a uh, archway that has uh, grapes growing on it. So when you, like, if we held events or even a wedding at the area, 
that would be a backdrop where people could get married in front of or do something. It would be super, super interesting to see what it will hold. And then within the other side there, this is our medicine wheel. What, what I'm aiming to create or build is a 40 foot medicine wheel that's a herbal first aid garden because some of the plants that we wanted such as, um, what is it called again? Like juniper and cedar, it actually won't grow too well because of the Saskatoons. Mm -hmm. They get each other sick. I don't remember the name of it that they give each other sickness. It's rust or rust mm -hmm. bug something. Or, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so within the medicine wheel, we, we'll be able to host, have a bunch of varieties of plants where it's still medicinal. We can have it make tinctures, we can make salves, we can make, have teas mm -hmm. and it, all the flowers will be edible and we can do many different things throughout. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our plans for the future. So for this year, we're planning um, to do a tree planting, some more tree planting workshops with the schools. Um, I'm not sure about your province, but here in Saskatchewan um, with our Sask Power, um, they have a greenhouse. And um, if you have, if you're an Indigenous community or if you have more than 10 acres, you can apply for free trees. And they're mostly for um, if you want to create a windbreak or if you want to like reintroduce um, native species into the area, like maybe it was decimated for like farmland or stuff like that, you wanna introduce trees back in, you can apply for trees there. So we we're gonna pick them up after this, actually we're really excited. We have a lot of trees coming, um, 2,400 trees coming. So we got our work cut out for us this year, but, um, the plan is to use a lot of them, like four windbreaks around the food forest. So each classroom will give them a specific section. And so every year they can come back and we can teach them new things about growing trees, about like pruning. Um, if maybe one doesn't make it, we can talk about why it didn't make it. Like, did it get enough water? Was it in the right space? Was it crowded by other things? Um, so using those, that free, um, free tree supply as an education opportunity for like the next 10 years, at least it's just exciting. We also want to plant more in our community garden that we will use in our cooking and canning classes. So for example, these are some of the things we've done in the past, like in February, we did a bison lasagna. And in, in the fall, we do a lot of canning classes. So we canned salsa and we canned peaches, but we had to buy everything. Um, so the goal this year is to use the fruit trees that we have and uh, make jam using those fruit or to, we always do raspberry picking and Saskatoon picking and blueberry picking trips. Um, we want to get enough on those trips and then um, partner like the next week to do a jam making class with the berries that we got. So we want to um, do things and partner like that a lot more this year. And we also offer a good food box every two weeks. Um, we buy the food from wholesale because it's cheaper than buying it from a regular grocery store, but we love to use our produce in those good food boxes. So those are one of the, our main goals for this year. For the long-term, because um, we are in our third and final year of getting funding from CFTC for our food forest, but the funding that we received really helped to set us up for success. Um, and we will be able to um, continue our food forest on. Um, one of our biggest goals is to really teach the importance of food sovereignty and sustainability. Like Jen said before, COVID has just really shone a light on how, um, fragile our system is, especially when everyone is scrambling for toilet paper. And even more recently, we've seen like infant formula in the States, child, children's Advil. And even like when lettuce goes on recall, you can't find lettuce at the store. Like we need to be growing that here so that we have it. We don't have to be impacted by those recalls. Um, we would also want to have a stable fruit and vegetable supply for the community. So uh, we want to continue that into the winter months too. We're looking at um, 
making cold storage facilities so we can grow even more potatoes and onions, but that we can also store them and have them available for people to use in the winter as well. And we wanna be able to support a community grocery store because we don't have one here. Um, it's frustrating when we have to go out and buy, or even with the local store, it's like five minutes away, but their produce sucks. It's really gross and it's really overpriced. So if we can grow that here, that is so much more meaningful for us. And I guess the ultimate goal, we, we would love to grow enough food um, for our school so that, because they don't currently have a lunch program, we would love to be able to grow enough food to support that program. That's it for us. Um, our contact information is up there if you want to contact us, but um, that's it for us. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Kristen. That was uh, wonderful. I learned a lot. Holy moly, you guys are really have your hands full there with all those trees this year. I'm impressed <laughs> and exhausted. <laughs> um, I am just going to share my screen here. Um, and we'll just introduce next uh, um, Lisa Troy, who uh, was with Skeetison, um Food Sovereignty as the coordinator and is now with um, the Cambridge Food Policy Council. Um, oh, there we go. And I'm just going to grab. Everything, her beautiful presentation here. So welcome, Lisa and um, I'll let you take over. Okay, good. Well, I guess you're not all from BC. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. Um, as Sue Ann said, my name is Lisa Troy. I was the Food Sovereignty Community Coordinator for the Skeet Dixon Band, and just recently um, moved from that role so I can focus on school. And um, I am also serving on the board of directors for the Kamloops Food Policy Council and on their um, Indigenous Food Group uh, Committee as well. Um, and I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge that it is a privilege and the kindness of the Shikwetmik people that has allowed me to live, work, play, love, and learn on their land, the Shikwetmik Ulu. Uh, I love being here. I love the rivers. I love the skies, um, the rolling hills, and the sun, and it's just, I am so grateful to be here every single day. And I would like all of you to just think of where you are or where you're from and how glorious it is, really. Uh, so the Skeetchison Community School uh, and Skeetchison Community are about um, 50 kilometers from Kamloops. Uh, the population on reserve is about 250 people and the community school what educates children k to 12 uh, with about 55 to 60 kids uh, population um, the being in that rural context um, it's what is referred to as being in a food desert uh, because there's just no like access, direct access to good, healthy, regular food besides what you grow yourself. So um, the closest grocery store, One Direction to Costco, that's like 35 minutes away. There's another little grocery store at 35 minutes the other way. And besides that, your choice for food is gas station food. And even that is 10 kilometers away from um, the main village part of Skeetosin. 
Um, there's no cell service there. There's no public transit. There is no to walk from like one part of the community to the other part of the community where people live would probably take you two hours. Um, so it's very disjointed and it really shows how important it is for them to create their own sustainable food system. And um, like what was mentioned before with COVID and with the, the highways getting washed out and all these sort of like ecological things that are happening with climate change and what have you, it just shows how vulnerable we are. Even when we live in cities, we're super vulnerable to uh, food being scarce and that sort of thing. And then um, include the fact that you're a one way in and out community. Um, it's just so difficult. And we're not even that far away from things, um, but it sure feels like that. <laughs> Um, and so the Ski Distant Food Program or Food Sovereignty Program has had many different um, parts that have come together. There are um, most of the what's going on is at the school. The school has uh, raised garden beds there. I think there's 20 raised garden beds now. And the food forest is there and there's much more infrastructure that's being built, but it also comes with um, the community plan from chief and council and their vision for everything and their um, support with the programming. And it comes from the social development team on how they're um, engaging the community and educating people on food literacy and um, gardening and canning and all these sorts of things. So it, it's coming from a lot of different angles. There's a lot of different moving parts. Um, and, and whether you're in a program already or you're wanting to start one, I just would say whatever your vision is, there's the whole process with that vision. It's not a destination. You're not just going to be like, okay, we want to feed a hundred people a week and then you're going to hit that and then you're going to be happy and done and it's going to be easy to get there. Um, it takes time and failure and work and you have to just trust that you have a good vision. Keep checking in that that vision is still good and still going to work for your community and you will get there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so my tip, if you want to start off with your program or you're rethinking about your program, is to start small and with direction. Because um, if you pull yourself in too many different directions, it's you're just going to do not well at a bunch of stuff. The food sovereignty program, um, the school itself has been around since 2010. It's always had support from chief and council to have food served in the school. Um, they know they felt like it was really important um, to make sure that all the kids have good, healthy food in their bodies. No one's being left behind. Um, doesn't matter if the kids are from Skeetison School, if they're um, indigenous or non-indigenous, if they're bused in from other communities, everyone gets access to good food all day long. And to support that, um, the infrastructure has been growing steadily and able to, to continue enabling this. So in 2016, it was a tiny greenhouse that was purchased with a farm to school grant. Um, building up 2019, there is, uh, they have a fully integrated food system design that incorporates the raised beds, the food forest, animals, water catchment systems, the whole nine yards. Um, and today it's still being um, constructed. Um, and now there's even more projects that are being added to that with um, 
a pit home and smokehouse and tanning shack and like all these other things so that this whole big thing will be a huge cultural agricultural land-based learning hub for the school for the community for the surrounding communities to show that what can be done um and and to just teach people and and just really foster care and interest in food and where it comes from um because if you were to ask kids even now a little bit but before definitely you asked the kids at the school where their food came from and they said big sky gas station <laughs> because that's where they got food from they didn't get that food comes from growing it <laughs> um so there was um, a lot of vision that went into um, getting to where they are and where they're going. Um, and a lot of that came from a community engagement learning circle, Farm to Cafeteria um, does uh, community learning circles where you come together with elders and teachers and students and community members and parents and and everyone comes together and they they really come to address local issues and and think about what needs to be done and where are the barriers and what are the hopes and the dreams and everything and identify these things and have those discussions so that what you come out with is like a real holistic personalized kind of way forward and it, when i was like wondering you know what kind of grant should i get next what kind of program should i focus on i would go back to the information in these learning circles and be like oh you know this thing got listed over and over again canning workshops got listed over and over again so i'm gonna do a canning workshop i'm gonna do, find someone who does canning and and that sort of thing and it, it always kind of like brought me back if I wasn't sure what I was doing or if I was what I was going to be doing was going to be the right thing, I could feel really confident because this is what the community literally told me that they want. Um, and not just me, I mean, told everyone what they want. So that was so valuable. I super recommend it. Um, either get a hold of Farm to Cafeteria or there's lots of um information out there on like world cafe style um engagement sessions and that sort of thing and so i super recommend that if you're not engaging with your community or you're not sure where you're you should be going um so um speaking on the food program that's at the skeeterson community school the the kids as well as the faculty get breakfast snack and lunch um, with the new cook that we have uh, had for the last two years she is absolutely amazing super inspiring and really focused on the health and nutrition of the food that the kids are getting um like we all know starting the day off with food for your brain when you're trying to learn all day long is so important and even if kids are coming from places where they do get breakfast in in their house in the morning that might have been hours ago because they had to bus in um or what have you and so like the breakfasts that are served are whole grain breakfasts whole grain cereals oatmeal um little kind of omelet breakfast things it's always full of like whole food protein fruit or vegetable it's it's there as brain food to get the kids going and the marie the cook will have options for them you know do you want blueberries or do you want strawberries or whatever but overall it's like you know, we're there, she's really trying to set up good, nutritious, whole food for them. Um, snack time comes up, um, a little pick me up during the day. It's 
always a fruit or a vegetable with dip. Um, again, Marie's thoughts are have the kids eat raw fruits and vegetables, which a lot of them aren't used to. Um, I know in my experience growing up, like vegetables at dinner time were microwaved <laughs> like 100% of the time. Um, microwave corn, microwave broccoli, whatever it was. So um, the enjoyment of raw vegetables is really <laughs> not something that uh, necessarily kids have. <laughs> and so that, and um, I know that there is a program and I assume it's in other provinces too, but I think it's through the BC Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation that sends um, the school flats of food that would be maybe a little bit more cost prohibited. Um, so like maybe they'd get a flat of um, snap peas or kiwis or things like that just to get the kids trying different things that they might not always like get normally or, or be interested in. Um, and same with what we grow in the garden um to you know try to get these other other things maybe there's purple pole beans instead of green pole beans just to show that there's like all these different options and all this amazing stuff that can be grown and and it tastes fantastic all of it um and then for lunch um i my favorite part of <laughs> of uh, lunches at the school are that um, Marie will hide vegetables. She's like a ninja with getting nutrition into these kids. They think they're just having regular like spaghetti and spaghetti, like spaghetti, right? But in that sauce, it looks like just tomato sauce. There is like carrots, onions, mushrooms, peppers, leeks, whatever you can think of, just blended into like pureed into a, a pulp. And then it still looks like spaghetti sauce, but it is just so much more healthy and nutritious. And um, it's really great to see that, you know, you don't have to fight kids all the time and kind of to get them to eat good. And um, and it's just so inspiring to have to see someone in a school kitchen that's really putting in thought and love and passion and and so much care into what she's doing for the kids. It's not just about throwing chicken nuggets at them, and um, it's it's really about good food for these kids and. You know, yes, for some of these kids, this is the best food that they're having all it, all week long, right? They go home and they don't have food on the tables or they don't have good food on the tables. Um, their parents are too busy for them or whatever, right? So if it's if it's only th three meals a day that they get that are really good, that's awesome. Um, and so, um yeah sorry I got, I got got a little emotional there <laughs> um so and Marie she's just a regular person a community member her youngest child goes to the school there still and there was a need for a cook position to be filled and she dived in um, and so there's, there's amazing people out there. There's passionate people who can do things that they never even thought of they would ever do. And they make the hugest difference and the whole thing, like she's so humble about it, but I'm just like such a fan because she has just made it so wonderful to work with. And any time that we have fruits or vegetables that have come from the garden and they're in her food, she will say so. She'll be like, hey kids, this is 
these these are the carrots that you grew in the garden this stew has vegetables from the garden and really like connects the two for them um which is just awesome so my next tip is find passionate people and um treat them well like don't don't like be like okay we have our one cook person bye um because that person's gonna get burnt out if it's always just like it's just her in the kitchen feeding everyone so she has to do everything and that's really tiring and really stressful sometimes and if she's sick then there's nobody um you, you know with funding make sure people have funding so that they can get the tools and equipment that they need to do their job well don't just let people flounder around and be like oh okay they're they're good at their job check mark go on to the next things um because the people are what's going to make the success happen and so yeah um speaking about the school engagement like i said the kids um are in the garden the gardens are at the school so um and they are very uh at the school very like on the land learning focus um and so they the kids are uh part of the growing process from start to finish they pick out seeds they plan what they want to grow in the garden they germinate the seeds they transplant the sprouts they have little grow stations in their classroom and like check in on them and have watering schedules they plant them in the garden they do the weeding they do the mulching um a lot of the harvesting they don't do because everything comes to like fruition in the summer <laughs> which is kind of a pain and i always feel really bad that like i have to do all the the harvesting and they're like missing out on the best part but there's still uh fall crops and so uh it's just it's wonderful to get them out there it's literally like right out the back of their classrooms and you know they finish their math homework early they can just go they get outside time and they can come and if one of us is out there um they you know we can help be like oh hey like let's we're we're picking tomatoes right now or like oh we're gonna move these rocks over to here or whatever and they um a lot of the time are really just stoked to be out there and interested in what's going on and you know that sort of thing so i love that it's right there for the kids to experience and i hope that as they experience that maybe not right now as kids because I, I don't know kids are kind of don't understand how their life is different from other people's lives but i hope that in the future they're going to look back and be like that was so amazing um that we got to grow things and and eat things and um and you know hopefully it en encourages them to like grow their own things and i'll say that this is like a lot of stuff's going on as you can kind of hear um and it is there's funding from so many different places and so if you're struggling you're not sure you know this this plan seems too expensive or you're not sure how to afford um I, i've gotten um funding from so many places there's like i said the chief and council are helping fund the program because they know that it's important for the kids to eat well free canada was a big um supporter when we were planting the tree uh the food forest and i know that they have programs going all the time for various things um Quemchin health society is our locals um first nations uh kind of umbrella takes care of a few of communities uh coordinating different health things and and running the health center and that sort of stuff so they're always on board for healthy eating and healthy lifestyle things i spark um farm to cafeteria and farm to school bc there's so many things out there um i find a lot of it is not it's stuff you can buy stuff you can make infrastructure um and that sort of thing but the people hours are not very well um dealt with in grants at this point in time so if you find anything that supports 
like labor hours and wages and benefits, jump on it. Um, otherwise, just be aware that that is one of the kind of lacking parts right now with funding. And so try to get, you know, if you have some money, use that for your people and then get the equipment or whatever from a grant and uh, just use your, your dollars wisely. Um, so let's see the tips, focus on one thing at a time. Like, what is your goal? Do you want to feed the kids healthier or do you want them to garden? Um, do you want them to do cultural things or do you want to like keep your budget with, you know, within what you have? Um, there's just so much that you could do, but if you try to do it all at once, it's going to be a pain. Um, ensure you're, you're having community and school engagement. Um, and that you're making sure that things are making sense and you're sticking on track for what is needed. Um, check in with the kids, make sure they're getting something out of it. If you just kind of push kids around and be like, okay, you're doing this now. Okay, you're doing this now. And they don't really understand what the point is. You haven't integrated it into your classroom learning. You haven't talked about concept, you just haven't had discussions around it, then it's gonna, their eyes are gonna glaze over and they're not gonna know what's going on. Um, if you have a garden, you have to think about who is taking care of this on weekends, on holidays, on summer break, when something goes bad or whatever, who's gonna be taking care of these things? A lot of times with when you're in schools or when you're in, um, you know, if you're at a, a health center or whatever, you're like Monday to Friday, but things still need to be watered on the weekends or a long weekend or whatever. Um, find passionate people, treat them well, make partnerships, um, make it your own. Everyone's needs and wants and facilities and journeys are going to be different. So you know, come to things like this, get lots of inspiration, but don't try to make it do the exact same thing because it's not going to work. You need to know, do it for what makes sense for your community. And take time to celebrate. It's all work and no play makes it lame. So um, yeah, have garden parties, eat tomatoes in the sun, be happy. It'll be better that way. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was so informative. I really want to have one of those delicious vegetable laden sloppy joes. I'm, uh, I know what I'm having for lunch. <laughs> um, it was great. Uh, and again, thank you. Um, so our Next uh, guest was Tim, but I don't think he is able to make it today. He had a family emergency come up. And so I think uh, Sydney was going to speak a little bit about um, the hamlet of Chalita and just what they have going on up there on, on behalf of him. So I will uh, let Sydney have the floor. Thank you for doing that, Sydney. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Um, but thanks, Suan. So, as Suan mentioned, Tim unfortunately could not be here with us today. Uh, last minute family emergency. So our our thoughts and prayers are sending um, are are sent towards Tim today, and we'll definitely do a check in to make sure everything's okay there. But I'm more than happy to provide just a quick brief overview of some of the things that are happening at um, the hamlet of Toledo up in Northwest Territories. So um, before I jump into things, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background on Tim. Um, I unfortunately don't know how long he's been at the hamlet of Toledo, but he sits in the role as the economic development officer. So he oversees a few different things and um, the uh, the gardening and the food the food side of things also landed in his wheelhouse. So, um, 
I will primarily focus on the garden programs that uh, Talita has going on, but before I get that far, just wanted to give a quick honorable mention um, some of the other programs that Talita also has going. So um, along the lines of the gardening, they have the local composting project where they rallied practically the entire community and have um, started this quite large composting project that they can, um, again, use towards the gardening. They have Meals on Wheels that is very successful. They offer um, meals to elders and other community members who require them directly to their house. And then also some healthy cooking classes that they run with the students and I believe some other community members as well. Focusing on our, our growing side of things, uh, the community does have a community garden in place. Last year, they produced a total of 4,500 pounds of produce that was uh, distributed to the community. So about 60% um, of that produce was potatoes and 40% uh, was a mismatch of some other things. So, and like I mentioned that that produce supported all all the households, uh, roughly 224 in the community, all received that uh, the, the vegetables from the garden. They also have an indoor growing program. So they have uh, those indoor growing towers. And last year they had supplemented an extra three towers to the school. Again, you'll have to um, excuse me, but I don't know the, the total that they're at now. I know there are quite a few going on in the school, but those school um, growing towers supplement the healthy cooking classes that I mentioned, as well as the school uh, meal program. So the kids are being trained on those garden towers, how to grow, how to um, you know, take care of harvest, all sorts of things with those growing towers. And then they're seeing the benefits from the school meal side of things. Lastly, I just wanted to highlight their Arctic acre growing dome. So in my humble opinion, this is the coolest thing that they have going on. I'm going to share my screen here. I want to keep in mind before I do, these photos I'm going to show aren't directly from Hamlet of Toledo. Unfortunately, we don't have any right now. These are just some that I pulled from the Arctic Acres website, just to give you an idea of what they look like and what they would uh, be growing in up north. So um, these Arctic Acre growing domes. So as you can see, dome greenhouse that can be grown in 365 days a year. Last time I talked with Tim, uh, he was at a total of three domes in the community. These domes grow food and also flowers, which I think is pretty nice. Um, two, of the, two of the domes are designated strictly for growing produce in a greenhouse type style. And then the third is used solely for those flowers. So the really neat thing about Hamlet of Toledo and how they're using these domes, with that flower dome, um, they have a group of elders who oversees the growing of the flowers. They use those flowers to build flower baskets, hanging baskets, and then they're sold to neighboring communities, to anyone who's around who wants the flower baskets. And then all the proceeds go back into the greenhouses so they're used to support the purchase of seeds, materials, maintenance, upkeep, whatever that money needs to go towards, um, which for all intents and purposes makes this growing system pretty self-sustaining. They've made um, a little local food system that they can supplement with the sale of their flowers and keep things growing in the community. So again, they can grow 365 days a year even when it's snowy out. Um, and up in Northwest Territories. So as you can imagine, it gets pretty cold up there. The growing domes are um, supported by solar energy. Don't believe we can see any of the solar panels on these ones, but they do come equipped with solar panels if you so choose, and it keeps the inside heated so that uh, your produce can stay nice and warm and cozy in the colder months. To give you a glimpse of the inside, this one is in construction, as you can see. 
the uh, beds you can set up in any sort of configuration. Um, this particular growing dome, as you can see, kind of went that curvy. I've seen ones that do um, along the outsides and then kind of a center. I've seen ones that have the traditional rectangular beds, so really open to any type of configuration that you so choose. Um, I will mention too that there's quite a few different sizes of the growing domes as well. So Hamlet of Toledo domes are on the larger side of things. So inside you can see it's pretty spacious. And again, just another look of some of the larger domes uh, that are out there. So. I always love to share the story of, uh, of what Tim and, and Hamlet of Toledo have going on because I think it's incredible what they have done. They can grow their produce while still growing, you know, the finer things of life, those flowers and how they've been able to make that, that self-sustaining system. Um, I did not do this justice by any means and um of course we wish wish tim were here but also sending all our well wishes out to tim and um i would be happy of course if anyone has any questions um comments to be able to pass those on to him um as well so sorry i couldn't give more of an in-depth in-depth look into that but um hopefully i did it a little bit of an explanation, okay, for everyone there. Sue Ann, I will uh, pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Sydney. I can't believe the size of those domes. Uh, the photo there, I was just impressed with the amount of space. I was like, I would love one of those in my yard. I love that they can grow flowers. I think that is just, you know, I mean, as much as we try to practice, you know, growing food and such, you know, sometimes, especially when you're up north, you know, that that thought of being able to have a little flower um, in a time where, you know, you're maybe surrounded by snow, which we do get here in the Kootenays too, you know, it's like six to eight months of perpetual winter. So it's uh, very admirous. And thank you so much for um, sharing on behalf of Tim today. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Maybe uh, to, I just mentioned Sue Ann, a little off note, but um, I'm just seeing some comments on the domes here. One of our other communities in New Brunswick that we work closely with um, just brought in a dome as well, and they're using it as a teaching tool in the school. So using it to be able to supplement the school salad bar and the school lunches, but also building it into the curriculum where students are out there and they're the ones having to take care of the dome, um, whatever's inside, harvesting, you name it. Um, so very, I mean, if you can... Have one in your community, it um, can definitely be useful towards the school growing program, school lunches, um, just a learning tool in general. So very beneficial in all sorts of ways. It's going to be on everyone's wish list this year. These are grants going out the door that'll just be like, and a dome, please. <laughs> oh, amazing. I um, just want to thank all of our speakers uh, for all their amazing shares. Um, and I do, I wanna open up the floor uh, to questions you may have um, and we'll do our best, uh, everybody will do the best to answer. Um, so please, uh, yeah, you can share in the chat as well and we'll be monitoring that and um, you can raise your hand, um, you can speak up. Uh, pretty open here. Again, thank you. I was going to say, I see a question in the chat already um, from Janelle. In your opinion, what's the difference between the dome and a greenhouse? Um, I can briefly address that. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the domes, but I think the biggest thing with um, these specific Arctic Acres domes are that you can grow in it 365 days a year. So with the setup that they have, the solar panel package, uh, where we see lots of our greenhouses, you know, having to be packed up over the winter. Um, so definitely a big, big advantage being able to grow throughout the winter. And um, I want to say too, just the material that they use is a little hardier, can withstand some of the, the more treacherous weather conditions.
yeah, definitely need one of those. I'm like going to be Googling that as soon as um, this afternoon, give it a check, see. How do I get one? Another winter um, gardening thing we've seen is the grocer, which is a sea can. So it's not like, doesn't let in natural light, but it's insulated and it lets you um, grow, grow, grow stuff 365 days of the year as well. But it's, um, it's all hydroponics. I think why I really like the dome where you can really just like shape it to how you want. I think the grocer is a little bit more of an industrial setup, um, but two really cool ways to, grow stuff when it's minus 40 here and we're just covered with snow. <laughs> yeah, the grocery unit is definitely another, um, you know, outdoor cold weather, cold weather growing solution, um, but only hydroponics too, which you mentioned, Kristen. So whereas the greenhouse gives you the flexibility to grow more of the, uh, traditional greenhouse or outdoor style style uh, type way. Yeah, we're getting one of those sea can, those hydroponic sea cans out here in the, the Kootenays. So that's a work in progress in the local food hub. And I'm, I'm excited to see um, how much that will produce. I think they're concentrating on greens for now, but that'll be, be really neat. We've got a couple more questions in the chat here. Um, I was wondering if the design of the pavilion and outdoor kitchen that is at Willow Creek Health School would be shared. We run similar programs that would be so awesome to have a kitchen uh, outside alongside an indoor cl outdoor classroom. Sorry, I don't know if I got that question justice. We can definitely share that with you guys. Can we send it to you, Sue Ann, and you can distribute to all the participants? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, another question. Curious if any of the speakers have to build things or plant certain plants to prevent wildlife from enjoying all the food. <laughs> I can speak on that a little bit. Um, our, because we're rural and we have, um, Oh, what is it called? Like the cow grates and fencing around the school area. So it's kind of um, protected that way. Although of course deer can jump way higher than that. Um, and then there's also strategic planting that's done to help deter um wildlife so for example we line our i th think in one of the pictures you saw like a line of garlic and we line each one of the rows of the food forest in garlic which deters things because it's smelly and they're like ew i don't want garlic um there's in the raised garden beds there's um lots of marigolds which deter pests um we'll uh also plant like things from the squash family because they have those very prickly leaves. So we will um, put those around the edges of our garden beds, trail them around so that it deters little rodents and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, we have on the ends of our food forest, there are um, prickly bushes. So like wild rose, um, sea buckthorn, um, and what's the other one? Oh, more, more wild rose. So again, that's just sort of like an animal comes up and is like, eh, it's kind of, I don't want to be against like near this bush. So they just go off somewhere else. Um, I, and we have, <laughs> we have painted like little rocks to look like strawberries and put them through our strawberry patch in hopes that <laughs> we will get the strawberries instead of the magpies. Um, the magpies are pretty good at getting all of the cherries. I don't think we've ever had cherries out of the garden. Um, yeah. Oh, um, gooseberries is another one of the prickly bushes. But yeah, so just like strategic planting and kind of like interspersing kind of prickly things or smelly things and with like all your really delicious things. 
um, is what we've been doing. And because we do not want to use traps or pesticides or any of that sort of stuff, right? So um, that's what we do. We do um, a lot of similar things as well. Um, we do try to be mindful that um, it was their land first. <laughs> and so, especially because we're, we're able to get free um, Saskatoons and choke cherries and pin cherries and everything from our Sask Power Greenhouse, we try to plant those, um, like we plant, we do the strategic planting on things that we want to keep for us, but then we also make sure we plant enough for the animals as well, because yeah, we're the ones that took over their space. So we want to be mindful of that as well. Thank you both for those thoughtful answers. I, uh, some great ideas now on what I'm going to be doing in my own garden. A few more, a few more cloves of garlic, I think. Um, there was another great question in here. Uh, Sydney answered how the domes are heated. Uh, how does one start a food forest? For the groups here, did you pick your plants based on your community's needs or curricular needs or just based on hardiness? Jen has a great answer. <laughs> so what we've had at the site is um, majority of our elders love Saskatoons and blueberries and who doesn't love berries? So we primarily focused on that. Well, partnering with the partnership that we have with the Atigameg, Atakakoop and Muskeg and other, or other places that we have within this group now is um, other locations have planted an excessive amount of other plants. So we thought that we would reduce our amount of apples because we can grow more berries in hopes of creating a trade agreement with communities. So what we have with Muskeg is they, they have over 130 apple trees and that is quite a bit. <laughs> so for them to be able to utilize all of that, they, they may come into a lot of waste they're not being able to use what they have so what we decided to do is well what we've looked at is our community is very rich with being able to grow berries tons of berries we have it all within less than a five mile radius I have about 10 different types of berries so we decided to use that within our community so now once we have the strawberries or raspberries, choke cherries, Saskatoons, whatever we harvest, we can create the trade agreement with Muskeg for our berries for their apples, reducing the amount of apples that we actually plant at the garden. So like just creating pathways and creating what, what we see our soil can grow is what we primarily focused on within our group. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to grow what works best in your zone and with your soil, because then you won't be disappointed when things don't come up. And then um, kind of tailor the curriculum to whatever you're able to grow well, just use the strengths of the, the landscape around you. Thank you for that. It's great. I just Sorry, Sue. I just wanted to mention quickly um, quite a few questions coming in about the Arctic Acres greenhouses as well as some companion planting. Um, I will put our little plug in right now that we do have an email distribution list with our Indigenous School Food Circle. If you're interested in getting on that list, you can send um, any one of us an email and we will be sure to add you and you'll have uh, access to the group to ask questions. Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Sian is planning it already. So uh, access has questions. We also have a resource bank. So um, I'll send out an email about this Arctic Acres because I think it'd be great for everyone to see. But sorry for interrupting. No interrupting. It, it's always, that's, that's great. Get that up there. And yeah, if you have any interest in, um, you know, getting involved with the school, uh, the Indigenous School Food Circle, um, you can check out our website there. And also, yeah, email any one of us. Um, Sydney's email is on the website uh, as well, just to um, send your interest. So 
uh, yeah, that that's us. And um, just gonna double check if we have any more uh, questions in the chat there. Um, yeah, I've got a little list going of the ones that haven't been answered. Um, Sydney, there's a question about are the domes heated or insulated? I know people could find online, but you might just be able to answer quickly. Um, they're heated using, so when, if you were to purchase one, you can choose to add on like a solar kit um, and it's heated, kept warm through this solar power kit. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but um, as far as the insulation goes, it uses like a super heavy kind of acrylic um, shell, I guess, and I guess it helps produce some warmth just through the the comings and goings of this acrylic outside shell. I'm sorry, I wish I could provide more information. I think as far as insulated go, it's, it's just um, really efficient at producing the, uh, the warmth from that. And then of course the solar power kit keeps it. I was also looking on their website, you can have the option of adding in kind of like an underground warming thing um, and a few different, you can add a pond into it, I guess. I don't know, super, super cool. I would just suggest you check out the website and they'll be able to answer more questions there. Thanks a lot. There was one question um, from somebody asking to see one of Lisa's slides with the funders. Um, Sue Ann, can you put that up while I'm going through the rest of the questions? Awesome. Um, there was one question about where can I find information about the food groups that work well together? So um, yeah, example, potatoes and and um, carrot pumpkins and squash um, and somebody suggested searching for companion planting but I'm wondering if any of the other speakers have any suggestions there and thanks for putting up that slide soon. And leave it up for a minute and then put it down. We have companion planting any any thoughts that folks can share. I just google it. <laughs> <laughs> Google <laughs> that Google is my uh uh what's the word teacher. So whenever I have a question or I'm not sure or I'm just interested, I just Google stuff. <laughs> Especially if you're um looking at your food forest, not really for gardening, but for our food forest, we looked at what grew well together in the forest too. So like nature can be your um example as well but a lot of it's trial and error hey just <laughs> the one thing about for companion planting that i've learned is um potatoes like onions uh carrots like onions but carrots and potatoes don't like each other so the remedy to that is putting onions between the carrots and the potatoes <laughs> so the crop grows down you have one that grows up so like having a variety of plants that help each other. Google is my teacher too, when it comes to companion planting. And mm -hmm. I, I recommend that to a lot of people. And it, it works like as long as you know what you want and the types of plant that you want, you can have a variety of different plants that can grow each other. Like mm -hmm. having a salsa garden and having the variety of herbs helping the whatever you're growing will it'll all work together as long as you just learn about what you want thank you that's uh i love that the, the carrot the onion and the potato and we'll note that as well we're just getting ready to plant in our garden here so um, i see there's a few more questions in the chat here um, wondering if student time investment is a challenge and how do you address that issue? We find teachers class time or administrator scheduling are not always invested in the curriculum connections. Is that something anyone can answer? So we, we have a community planting day and like for me personally, it's a little too much to have a large group or the whole school come in and expect a plant. And I would be psychologically not available to <laughs> handle that large of group. So what we have done is we went to the school, talked to the principal, talked to the teachers, 
and told them, okay, we would like to be able to do this with the class. Um, is your class interested in being involved with this programming? And the teachers would have their set schedules. So we work with the school schedules to ensure that each class has amount of time to be able to work in the garden in. So right now they're doing the gardening in the classrooms right now. So once they are ready to transplant plants or whatever they would like to do, we will adjust our schedule to work with the school schedule so that nobody's left out. Everyone has the ability to learn something. Everyone is actively involved. And then we can just carry that on with each classroom that would like to be involved. I think we're really lucky too that we have someone like Jen, um, cause she's from the community and she's so, so very passionate about what she does. Um, so when we do have school groups coming in May and June, um, we also were lucky that um, our band um, pays for summer students. And so we get a lot of the summer students in July and August, which is really tough when like that you don't have school those days. Um, so then those students are super excited to come, like they've worked May and June, but now they can be paid to come work in the garden as well. So we're lucky that um, there's a couple different ways that we get students to help. It's not just all volunteer based, like taking time out of the school day. Um, and I know not everyone has, has the ability to do that though. In the Skeetison Community School, um, it is the garden time is like a predetermined time. It's, you know, what depends on what the school year looks like, but it'll be like, okay, we're in there with the kids Tuesdays from 1030 until 1130 and Thursdays from 2 or 130 to 230 or whatever. And so um, then it's just a matter of like, that's part of their schedule of whether that, I, I don't know how the teachers coordinate that with what they have to do, but the point of on the land learning is that it's part of what you're learning, right? So whether that is math, cause they're doing like how many, what's the area of whatever, or it's, um, you know, for little kids, is it counting? Is it art time? Is it science? Is it like that can all be integrated in with it? And um, yeah, so it's it's there. The teachers there are very much on board. They love it. The kids love it. And so that's just like integrated into what they're doing all the time. I would have really enjoyed math if it had something to do with gardening. I'm. Uh... I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, and cooking too, right? Like if you do a cup and a quarter cup and a third of a cup or whatever, hmm. changing recipes. And so there's lots of things that you can do. Conversions, I love that. I just want to echo what Lisa said in lots of our communities. Um, one in particular, I'm thinking of the school garden. You need that, like the really committed teacher, the really committed group who's willing to do it. Um, so in that case, the teacher is the science, the science teacher. She teaches other other courses too, but um, she has her, I believe she has the grade sevens are the ones who like do the planting and everything. And then the grade eights are the ones who do the harvesting or something along those lines. But then she uses everything to teach every subject. So the science and the math aspect she uses um, in her English language arts class, she was telling me they had to write, um, I can't think of the word, but like a, the steps of like how to garden. So like writing out the processes, that's what word I'm looking for as a writing activity, art, cooking. So everything um, in her curriculum has to do with the garden. And I think it's just, you know, you find your committed individual so like Lisa said, like Kristen said, like you, you have your one really committed teacher, you have your one really committed person in the community who's willing to champion that, and they can um, really run with it and do some great things. Thank you for I sharing. 
Oh, I was going to say, I don't know how it's going to go this year because um, I'm not there this year, but the school, they divided it up into like four teams, blue team, green team, whatever. And each of those teams are um, a collaboration of like all the different grades. So you'll have like little kids, medium kids, big kids in each one of the teams. And so the teams are gonna be the ones going out into the garden together. Um, and that helps because the older kids can kind of help corral the younger kids and they can work together because when you're only one adult or two adults, and now all of a sudden the whole grade three, four class comes out, it's like, you know, just chaos. So <laughs> um, smaller groups we were trying to do, but all, yeah, now they're gonna do the integrated groups. And so hopefully that'll be, I'm not sure how that works with their class schedules, but um, that's how they're going to be splitting it up so that there's more support and they have like this, I don't know what else they do with the teams in this regular school year, but that's part of it. Amazing. Thank you for adding that, Lisa. Um, I will be mindful of time here as we are kind of getting closer to the, the end of the webinar. Uh, we're right on. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a question about funding and, and resources that way, and uh, we'll be happy to share that in an email after. Um, we can compile some um, different ideas on that realm. And I see there's been some comments too about uh, learning circles and such, um, and um, some about uh, a no-kill garden, um, maybe explaining that. That was another one. But I see some of the questions have been answered, uh, so I'm very grateful for that, uh, for those who answered in the chat. And um, yeah, I think that the no-kill garden was the only other one that somebody wasn't sure about. And lots of great ideas have uh, funneled out of this so far today as well. So um, yeah, just very grateful for everybody's uh, time today and um, for sharing what they have happening in, in their areas. Um, it's kind of nice, you know, that they spread across uh, Canada and just all the different regions of what is possible. I think that is fantastic. And the integrations of what and ways uh, we can do things within the school systems as well. Food systems are so vast and, um, and so is Indigenous food sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty. And I'm very grateful for everybody's time once again. Um, thank you. I'm just going to share a quick screen here one more time. Um, just a few different languages uh, across here um, and different ways to say thank you. Um, so if you, uh, I'm just like I said, thank you again for your time. I agree. And Greek. Um, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar, um, which will be a few months down the road, of course. You can look forward to our newsletter. Feel free to uh, email one of us if you're interested in joining the circle um, and getting um, information that way. And just look forward to follow up from us on more uh, information and um, answering some more of these questions that may not have gotten uh, to today. So. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you for being here. <laughs>